Hello everyone, I'm Linda Nickel and welcome to the Happiness Hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire and create. Every week I invite a speaker to share their photographic expertise with us by using a special technique, artistic creativity or in a story of inspiration. A list of upcoming presentations can be found on my website at lindanickel.com. Under Happiness Hour, you'll find the links to previous sessions on my YouTube channel. So please subscribe, like, and share. Elaine Pruden is here tonight to keep things running smoothly. So say hello, Elaine. Hello, everybody. Our guest tonight is Keith Bozeman. A nature photographer based in Alabama, Keith's work has been published in books, magazines, and newspapers. He also leads photography workshops, and if you're interested in waterfalls and forests, you should consider visiting him in Alabama. In tonight's presentation, Planning for Great Light, Keith shares his philosophy on the importance of planning and finding great light. So welcome to the Happiness Hour, Keith. Um, I I've been following you for a while on Instagram. And time after time, I'm reminded just how small the world is, because you actually know one of the people that was instrumental in teaching me the importance of scouting and what good light looks like. So that guy is John Sharp, who is also in the room tonight, and he is scheduled for an, a happiness hour presentation for later this, later this spring. But back to Keith. So um, Keith, welcome to to this program. And uh, before you get started with your presentation, would you like to take a minute to add anything that I may have missed in your intro that you'd like for to like to share with us? Well, I'd just like to say thank you, Linda, for uh, you know, taking an interest in my photography and giving me this opportunity to, uh, to speak in such a uh, and to really, I mean, it's going to be on YouTube, so it's a lot of people, you know, and I just appreciate that opportunity ah. um, very much. The pleasure is mine, and I always say this to people, you know, it's easy for, you know, me to reach out to people and, and cross my fingers that they, they say yes, and it always surprises me when they do, and um, everybody brings something different to this, to this program, and um I, like I said, I've been following you for a while and I, I knew that I was probably going to need to see Alabama at some point, but uh, you've, you've kind of push, pushed it a little higher up on my list. So with that, I'm going to let you get started. And again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you again. Um, so yeah, I, I, you mentioned about, you know, uh, wanting to see Alabama now, and that's really one, been one of my big goals is just you know, I, I love photography and I love traveling. There are beautiful places around, but just you can find beautiful places just locally if you just look. I mean, uh, Alabama has so many beautiful places to offer. And uh, and, I and a lot of the things that you're going to see are from Alabama just because I have places staked out all around within 20 to 30 minutes of where I live, maybe an hour. And, uh, you know, I'm just waiting for the right light. And so I, and so we have lots of beautiful places, lots of waterfalls and lots of waterfalls, lots of canyons, lots of forests and beautiful forest. And uh, it just, I, I love our state and I hope that uh, y'all will gain a deeper appreciation for our, for our state as well. First of all, I'll talk a little bit about myself. Um, I, I've been, I, I grew up in Stone Mountain, Georgia. I lived there for 18 years and then I went off to school in Florida and then eventually wound up in North Alabama and went and did my undergraduate work at the University of North Alabama and then my graduate work at uh, and there as well. And I uh, met my wife, Melissa, who uh, this June I'll be married 24 years to her and we have three girls. And um, it was at that, when, when our second daughter was born, that was the time when digital cameras had uh, come down in price where the common, you know, just where you could actually afford them. My first camera was a, an Olympus C2000Z, a 2.1 megapixel camera. Of course, the one I shoot now is like 36 megapixels, so quite, quite a bit different. Uh, but, uh, but that's when I started out was in 2002 when she was born. Just to take pictures of them, her, and, uh, but I, I was always an avid hiker and explorer and I loved to get out in the woods. And, um, and so I just started taking that camera with me and, 
and taking snap and shot. And it actually took pretty good shots for a point and shoot camera. I got a couple of pictures published and in a couple of contests. And so I kind of, that got my, you know, I, I kind of picked it, started getting a lot more interested in photography. And then eventually the, my great, the greater my interest, um, the, I, I bought a Canon 10 D it, but still even at that time I was studying other people's pictures and looking to see what kind of camera they use and thought it was the camera that really made the biggest difference. But we all know it doesn't. It's the person behind the camera that makes the biggest difference. And, uh, but I, I shot with the 10 D for a long time. Then I went to a 5 D Mark I. And uh, I kept that camera for a long time because it was an incredible camera. And then I started host having uh, photography workshops. I started doing that. And, and my clients were all using cameras that had live view on them. So, and I was still using my 5D Mark I that just had the, you know, just view screen. That was about it. So eventually I moved up to the Canon 6D and, and I kept that camera for, excuse me, a long time many years and I loved it. I loved it very much, but I really wanted to move up to something bigger. And uh, Canon at the time just didn't have anything that I really had to offer. Uh, so I decided to switch to Nikon. And so now I shoot with the Nikon D810 with, uh, with Sigma art lenses. And I just, I love that camera system and lens combination. Um, I do enjoy photography and uh, I really enjoy uh, teaching photography to others and also sharing my art with others and meeting great people like all of, your, all of you that are here. And I uh, hope that the presentation I have tonight, will be, you'll find some benefit to it. Um, I love to shoot waterfalls and uh, streams and also forests like Linda said and also like mountains. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of big mountains in Alabama, but we do have some pretty big canyons, and I'll talk about that later on. Um, but and and, and I've, I've moved on to uh, shooting for my kayak. One of my greatest, my, my mentor, I guess we might say, Charles Seafried, used to see, shoot from his kayak. And, and that's something I've started doing over the last few years. And it's just a, I love to do it. And I'll talk about, you know, why it's important to put yourselves in new, unique situations where you can get pictures that other people are not getting. And, and it, you know, it, it's just it's finding that new niche is always a good thing in photography. Um, and so, but my main focus, of course, like I said, is now I teach photography workshops. I enjoy taking people out in the wilderness. Uh, some people I've taken out and they've never even been hiking before. And they're just like ready to go the next day again, you know. And uh, so it's just, a, I just enjoy it. I, I'm a teacher. I'm a full-time uh, biology teacher at Decatur High School in Decatur, Alabama. I've been teaching for 22 years and I, I love teaching. And so that just kind of, whenever I, you know, was starting to think about making money and photography, really the, the workshop appealed to me because I was already so accustomed to going to educational workshops. So I kind of knew how workshops went. And so it just kind of worked out for me. I just do it part-time. I don't have time to really do a lot of workshops, but I do enjoy doing it. And I do have uh, quite, you know, I have my workshops feel pretty good, feel pretty fast. And people really like my workshops. I take them to really beautiful places in Alabama, uh, some secret places that a lot of people don't know about. Um, you know, uh, and like I was saying, I'm a teacher, but I also work through the summer as well. I mean, my, my job never ends. I'm working at night, daytime. Like I got to go work again tonight when I get done here for class tomorrow. But uh, so our schedules are very, really busy. All of us, our schedules are very busy. And so, um, you know, we want to try to make the most of our time. And so when we go out and shoot, we really do want to try. We in hopes, we hope we get good light. But, you know, a lot of times people go out and they just go like, OK, I'm going to go shoot tonight. I'm going to go try to shoot sunset. And they come away disappointed. They don't really get that calendar shot they want because it just, it just didn't work out. Well, the thing is, what I want to do tonight is show you some techniques and methodology that may help to increase the chances of capturing great light. And that's really what I want to do is, you know, just do that. And then really, it boils down to proper planning. That's really, you know, to get great light, it, a lot of, some of it's luck, of course. But other, but other, most of the time it can be, it can be come, it can just be as simple as just proper planning. And so I want to speak tonight about planning for great light. 
So what I want to do is I'm going to first start with an image that I think is, you know, it's okay. It's technically sound. Uh, there's a few things wrong with it now that I look at it from years ago. Uh, but uh, these are called Cahaba lilies in there. Uh, and this is, you know, this is just one case of many beautiful places in Alabama. Uh, we have these Cahaba lilies that, and they're endangered and they look, they're, um, or at least threatened. And they are found in just about three places across the United States. And they, they uh, reside in the Cahaba River is one of the places in near uh, Tuscaloosa and kind of in between Tuscaloosa and uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And basically there are flowers that sit out in the middle of the river. They live, they grow in the shoals of the river. And so uh, I went this particular, uh, this, this was an evening shot. And uh, I went and I didn't really plan to shoot the cobble. I mean, I did, but I didn't really investigate. And I just kind of went down there and shot. And this is what, you know, without planning, this is what like a typical shot you would, you might get. You get some okay clouds, but it really just, most of the time you just got a few clouds, maybe 30% chance of sky cover, 20% chance. And that's usually not gonna lead to really great light. Um, but um, so, I mean, this, like I said, this image is technically pretty good. It's sharp, it's got fairly good composition, except for this flower that's down here at the bottom right-hand corner, it's bugging me. But, you know, as a rule, it's pretty nice. This was a, um, hand blended image for focus. Uh, this was before uh, focus stacking can be done in Photoshop. So, I mean, I was already at that point where I could blend images, uh, but, uh, but this is a sample of when it really, and this was my first time visiting the Cahaba Lilies. That's what I meant, to, I meant to say that as well. Well, I loved it so much that I decided to go back the next week. But when I went back the next week, I wanted good light. And so, uh, and so I did a lot of studying and I'm going to show you all my procedure of how I, uh, I plan for great light. Okay, so I did get a couple of photos that I like, for example, like this, uh, this rattlesnake was sitting right in the trail when I, uh, when I was walking down the trail, I just, I'm just glad I, it was very, it was about a foot long and it didn't, you couldn't hardly hear it rattle. Uh, but uh, uh, I, it was an interesting story. I went, you have to go out to the Kabbalilis. You have to cross out to the river. It's really slippery. And this particular day, the current, you can see the water's kind of up. You can kind of see it flowing uh, right here in the center of the screen. Uh, pretty, it's pretty fairly high. And on my way back out, back to the shore, I just took the wrong step and my feet went out from under me and I just went down in the river and it took me down <laughs> downstream. But fortunately I have a, a low pro uh, rover, which is like, it's, totally waterproof and it just kind of kept me afloat and I kind of just drifted off and got out of this out of the out of the out of the current and back onto the shore but I came across this rattlesnake on the way back and at least came away with one good picture that I really like because it was one of the prettiest timber rattlesnakes I've ever seen and uh, but anyways uh, so anyway so so I went back the week later and this is what I got but this was because of proper planning so there's several things that I do um, that I that I use and also that I do to judge what when there's going to be great light. And so one of the things and I'm sure most of you, especially on here that are here tonight, are familiar with is photographers ephemeris or some of you may be familiar with photo pills. They're both very similar programs. I've just been using photographers ephemeris for a long time, so I'm most accustomed to that. So and it's pretty simple to use. So the first thing that I do is I use photographers ephemeris to figure out where the sun, sun, sunrise is going to be. So here would be, let me, I'm going to close this window a little bit because it's interfering with, let me see, uh, with my view. Um, so here is the, the biggest shoal, uh, excuse me, biggest group of Cabo lilies. It's called Hargrove Shoals. I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit so you can see. And um, so when I plan this on this particular day, you can see sunrise is right here and sunset is right here. And uh, of course it tells you the sunrise sunset time. And so that gives me at least that, uh, that data. Um, and so you can see in the picture, the sunrise is right here. And so that just corresponds. You can just pick it perfectly. And I'll show you some other pictures that are you know pinpoint accuracy. Um, so I, so I got my sunrise sunset times and I knew where to be set up. 
So when I get there, I got there, I usually leave about two o'clock in the morning to get down there. It's about two hours from my house. So I get down there before, uh, before daybreak and I'll walk out into the, the, the river and I set up in front of the flowers, got my composition, got all set up. And, uh, but another thing, and so another thing I looked at to make sure, and this is really the key thing that leads to great light. And that is I check Noah weather. You've got to become a weather expert. I'm not a weather expert, but you got to know a, a little, a few things about weather. And so um, one of the things I do, if, when you go to NOAA, if you just type in your zip code, it'll bring up your weather for the day or the next few days. And the, down here, the hourly weather for, uh, forecast is the most important thing on the website for predicting fo uh, good photography. And so let's just, loo let's just use today's uh, data uh, at, to illustrate, um, the first thing that I look at is, uh, is cloud cover. That's the number one thing. And typically, I will not even get up out of my bed unless it's about 40 to 60 percent cloud cover. Just not, I mean, I don't even bother unless, and I'll talk about the exception to the rule, but 40 to 60 percent, that's a good chance of having cloud cover. And so that at least, if you've got some cloud cover, then you know you're at least going to get some you know, you know, some decent light, some good light that's going to look good in a photograph. Whereas if you go on a 10% or 20% or even 30%, most of the time you're not going to come away with a good photograph. So 40 to 60% is safe. If you go to 70% and 80%, that's also good if you've had like a lot of storms. If you've had a lot of storms, sometimes that, and if you're watch tracking the storm, if it's going away, um, you can know what direction the wind's going. Uh, sometimes you can get just, you all know, that little gap in between where that sun comes down after a storm, when it comes down below that storm uh, cloud, you know, you just get that spectacular light. And so that'll usually happen around 70, 70 to 80 percent sky cover. Uh, and so you can take risks that way. So if it's going to storm and then start to open up right near sunset, maybe an hour before, then that's a good time to be, you know, judged to get some pretty spectacular light too. So sky cover is the number one thing. Forty to sixty per six, six. Start again. Forty to sixty percent chance. Another thing that I look at is temperature and dew point. Okay. You now Linda talked about that. You know that smoke. Well, what's an, what's another thing that's like that fog, right? We want those foggy conditions because you get those beautiful beams. And so that's another thing I like to do when I'm shooting forest, I like to capture those beautiful beams and there's a way to predict that. And so what you gotta do is you look at the weather graph and for example, what you wanna look at is a dew point in temperature. So at sunrise, if the dew point and temperature are about one degree apart, right at one another or about a two degrees apart from one another, then it's a good chance, at least that's one, one thing, one factor, that there could be some fog. The other factor is, is humidity. If it's around 95% humidity, then you're gonna get some, 95 to 100%, then you're gonna get some serious fog. Um, especially after like in the summertime, if you've got the dew point and temperature agreeing and you had a hard rain before, the night before, you better believe I'm gonna be in the forest shooting these beams. Uh, because that's usually a good sign that there's going to be good light. Another thing that goes into that, though, is wind. You don't want to be, you're not going to have fog if you have a lot of wind. So it's usually got to be around between one to two miles per hour uh, so that, uh, so that uh, you know, it doesn't push the, the fog away too fast. So really, that's, that's what it boils down to, sky cover and also uh, fog. Another thing, and that's what I was going to say, 10% is good on a day when the dew point and temperature agree, and then also the humidity is high. When it's 10% sky cover, that means that the sun is going to be at full force and it's going to get the full rays and it's going to give you those sunbeams. Okay. And so that is a, so that is a, a nut. So NOAA is a very important site to, uh, to gauge your weather predictions. Like I said, weather is what it's all about, just predicting the weather and looking at that, da that data and looking for 40 to 60%. And then you can, that ups your chances of getting good light instead of just, like I said, randomly going out. Um, 
Another thing that I use here in Alabama, which I still think would apply in Texas and other states, we have a great resource and that is Alabama Whitewater. And so I'm gonna take you to that site and show you what it is, is a, it was originally built for canoes and kayakers when they're wanting to see if the water levels are high enough to be able to, uh, to, be able to kayak the streams in Alabama without bottoming out and having to drag kayaks. Well, in here, and this is what I'm saying, most states have a, the USGS keeps the flow rates for each stream. And so if there's a stream or if there's a forest around you that a major stream runs through, you can look at the flow rate of that stream and gauge whether you want to waste your time going down there. Just like John talked about um, in the Smoky Mountains, you know, when they went up there, it was really dry that time. Well, you know, if it was super dry, I would kind of watch the water levels on the USGS to say, okay, do I really want to go up there? Because I can't get, you know, stream shots if it's really dry, okay? And so uh, you want that, that perfect combination of flow and, and leaf color. You can use the GS to, USGS uh, rip, flow page here to gauge it. So let me give you an example. One of the places that I shoot a lot in is Bankhead National Forest, and I'll show you some pictures of that later on. But um, the Sipsi River runs through Bankhead National Forest, and uh, the river basin is called the Warrior Mountain Basin and or tributary, a warrior river, excuse me. And so what, and so what I look at is the Sipsi River. And if the Sipsi River is low, like here it's showing it's low, but you can see if, uh, you know, the, the, the mean, me, uh, the mean, I look at the mean, like right now it's 271 feet per uh, cubic feet per second, I think. That's actually a pretty high number for the Sipsi. So because of that, I know that if I go to Bankhead, I'm not gonna waste my time going to photograph a waterfall, there not being water there, okay? So, but I don't even look at the graph most of the time. I just look at this. If, if the Sipsi is rising, like here, the Cahaba River is high um, right here. Uh, these are low, so I wouldn't go shoot waterfalls in these areas if they're real low. Uh, this one is, you know, real low. This one's just kind of low, the Sipsi is, but if it's like normal, then I would be, I mean, I feel confident I could go drive an hour away and get, come away with some pretty decent shots. So uh, as far as water's concerned. So check out your, uh, your local stream, USGS stream data, and you can kind of gauge, you know, whether you should go to a place uh, and if the water's flowing at that place. Because if the big stream is going up, then that means that the little streams and the waterfalls that are feeding it are probably high as well. At least, at least that's the that's the logic behind it, right? Okay, so when I chose this picture right here, I mean, I, I've seen it where the Cahaba River was not flowing good at all, but it also, the big thing is you don't want to be out in the Cahaba River when it's flowing at high rate. And so I waited. I mean, I, I sometimes I will wait several years before I get the right light and the right uh, river flow and everything before I actually make the trip down there to shoot and typically I'll come away with good images. Now this image was taken, this is one of my most more, more popular images. I've got a big print of this in the Auburn, Auburn Museum of Natural History of this one. It sold several times uh, in various ways, but, um, but so that was, this was taken I think back in around 2010. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. And so um, again, I went back down, I, I did my data. I actually got a pretty, a real, a, I think a better sunrise uh, this time, just cause it was all across the sky. And I was right in front. I shot this was a 12 to 24 Sigma art, F4 art, the new one. And it, and it, it just, you know, that, that flower is like right in front of my, of my lens. I even got pollen on my lens, I think uh, from it being so close. Uh, but, uh, but there's another shot. Um, Another thing, uh, like I said, trying different things. Uh, I went back this past May and I shot them at night. Um, I got down to the Cahaba River uh, in the, that, that, uh, that evening around five o'clock and I scouted probably for a couple of hours to find the right, uh, to find, right, find the right patch of flowers. And, uh, and so then I set my camera up and I shot, uh, I waited till the blue hour. I mean, right when there was light, I think it may have been like a 30 second exposure, but then I pushed, you know, I pushed up my ISO and, um, but 
I captured this like right at the blue hour. And then I left my camera out in the middle of the Cahaba River for hours until, until the Milky Way appeared. Now, uh, I don't, I know there's been so many experts on here uh, before about star photography. So I'm just gonna just kind of share you what I used. Well, first of all, in Alabama, we don't have a lot of dark sky areas. Um, there is there is a dark sky map on the web, and um, and it show it will show you where uh, where and West Blockton Cahaba River is all right in here. Uh, you can't see it. Uh, let me let me do this. I got to change the light pollution down to low. So West Blockton is actually right in here. Cahaba River is right in here. So you can see it's not exactly got the best uh, area for light uh, dark sky. But, but we're looking this direction. And so here it is a dark sky area, not completely dark, but it's getting pretty dark. And then what's cool about it is an, I found that these little towns like this town right here, most of the time they'll turn their lights off around 10, 11 o'clock. And so it's almost like you have a dark sky zone. Uh, it just kind of gets extended, especially if you're shooting that direction. And so that's exactly what it was. I have never seen the, in Alabama, the, the Milky Way so intense as, a, as it was down there. And so um, I used a program called Stellarium to, uh, to predict the light, predict where the Milky Way would be. Of course, they have all kinds of apps uh, now, but um, let me just go ahead and set it here. So this was two, uh, 2020. And this was May the 21st. Set your location. And uh, this particular time, this is 2100. Uh, so we're looking at what, 10 o'clock or so uh, now. And so let's just keep going up. So now we're at 12 o'clock and oh, we're north. Hold on, let me turn it around here. Okay, so I knew it was southwest, it, it runs southwest. Uh, the uh, the river does. So I wanted to see how well it would line up. And so we're at one o'clock now. And so about 1.30 is when I took my picture. Let's go back and look at the picture. And you can see it's perfectly lined up. That's about, was about, I think around 1.30 when I shot the shot. So I took those images and blended them together in Photoshop and got the final image. And, uh, and I was pretty happy with this image because most of the time you'll see people shoot the Cahaba lilies uh, light paint them and I, it just doesn't look right with that warm light. Um, I, I just wanted a more like natural looking image and it really if you I've been in the cop, middle of the Cabo li lilies at night in a full moon and it really is lit up, especially in a camera it's really lit up this bright. Uh, so um, anyways because you know the flowers are white so they just really stand out. All right, let's move on now since uh, does anybody have any questions about my methodology before we move on? I, I, Keith, I don't see anything in the chat other than this is great information. <laughs> okay. so, All right, uh, well, feel yeah. free to ask if you have any questions. I, I, like I said, I, I don't like to hear myself talk. I'd rather, I'd rather answer questions if you have, have them, if I can, you know, but, uh, but anyways. Oh, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. Here comes a question. I've got one for you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Have you tried linking Sky, Skyfire to TPE? Uh, I have not because that's, a, I think it's a su subscription and I've already, it's our, now you have to subscribe to uh, Photographer's Ephemeris, just pay a fee and then you have to do Skyfire. So I just never, I've done it because, um, because I've, I've been pretty, I'm pretty good at predicting light. So I've not really had the need for that. I don't mean to sound arrogant about that. I just, I've been, I usually am fairly lucky, I guess, maybe, I don't know. Um, so I do have an app called, uh, I think it's called Alpine Glow that I use on my phone. And, you know, I think I, you know, it's just, I don't even use that app just because I, I'm so accustomed to been, I've been doing this for so long, uh, this way that I just, I just don't use it. Does anybody else have any questions? I hope that answers. Yeah, there, I've got, hang on, here we go. So Jamie wants to know, and it's a great question, Jamie. Uh, do you worry about snakes at night in or near the river? She's a little paranoid about water moccasins. I'm the same. Yeah, that, yeah they're there. I mean, they're there. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable around snakes. I mean, I used to have snakes in my classroom, so I'm pretty comfortable and I've come across water moccasins and, yeah, but I'm careful. I'm careful. I'm using pretty, pretty bright headlamps and 
and it's really shallow water where it's there. So it's, it'd be pretty easy to see them uh, for the most part. Okay. Um, as far as your kayaking, uh, Elaine wants to know, do you have any tips for shooting from a kayak, keeping your equipment dry other than a dry bag? Uh, that's what I use as a dry bag. Okay. I just use a dry bag and I take my kayak out and when I'm ready to shoot, um, I just, what I typically, what I'll talk about it in a minute, oh, in a minute, see, I may even get to my pictures. Um, what I do is, is I'll, um, I'm usually using aperture mode and I'll pick most of the time around F11 or so and I'll bump my ISO up. Usually at sunset, I can shoot F11 to F11 of ISO 800 and I bracket my shots, I set it for bracketing and I just sit there and just, you know, just, just as fast as I can shoot with hopes that I will get a series that's sharp. So I take quite a few images, but most of the time, especially with my 12 to 24 now, that's an F4 lens. I mean, I can get, and my Nikon D800 and D810 is such great with dynamic range that most of the time I can just get a single, almost a single shot and be able to blend, you know, not even have to blend them, um, which was a, sh yeah, anyways, I'll just say that. I'm not going to get on camera. I'm not going to get on camera systems. So, anyways, but uh, but that's that's how I do it. And I and yeah, I'll, and you can get it if you're steady enough. You can hold that camera steady enough. If you're using the reciprocal factor, you know, if you're shooting, say, if I'm shooting at 12 millimeter, I at least have to shoot one twelfth of a second or faster. And if you're doing that, most of the time you're going to get uh, most of the time you're going to get a sharp image. Great. Okay, let's go. All right, so let's, let's, let's get the pictures. <laughs> All right, so um, this October, past October, I, I decided to, I was really craving going to the mountains. I really have missed the mountains. I haven't been to the mountains in several years. And I wanted to capture some fall color in the mountains. And we just happened to have fall break and it happened right, happened right around this fall colors in the Smokies. So um, I did what I said I do. I, I studied the weather and, uh, and it looked like it was gonna be I'd reserved like four days and, uh, the, and I ended up just canceling because I thought it was just going to be stormy the whole time. But, um, but I was studying the weather and it looked like, again, it was going to be storming the whole day, but the whole time, but then the weather changed. I was staying the weather and the weather changed. So I went back quickly and reserved my spot again. Fortunately, I had this place available and it stayed at the campground. And, uh, and I just shot up to the, and shot up to North Carolina, to the Blue Ridge Parkway. This was outside of Cherokee at uh, Woolly Back Point uh, Overlook. Um, but, but going back to my methodology, before I even went up there, I got on Google Maps, first of all, and I took, because I hadn't been on the Blue Ridge Parkway in like years. So I, I didn't know what it was, I didn't know what the viewpoints were like or anything. So I got on there and took the little man and drug it on the, on the road where you can do street view. And I stopped at each overlook and just in the area, and I gauged what the overlook was going to be like before I even went there. Looked, I look up the overlook online, did a lot of research, and then I'd use photographers ephemeris and find out where the sunrise and sunset places were. So I knew when I got there, and I didn't have a lot of time. I had like a day and a half. My car actually broke down on me going up there. Fortunately, it was stormy that morning. Uh, my alternator went out on me in the middle of the night. And I got it fixed, and by the and I got there around 12 o'clock, and from 12 o'clock on, and I knew the weather was going to be good because we just had real stormy weather. It's going to be stormy off and on, but sun coming out off and on too, and so that's just like the perfect weather combination for a great light. And I shot from 12 o'clock all the way till sunset. I just had great light all day long, and so you just kind of got to look for that weather. I mean. Go shoot in bad weather. I mean, that is the thing. It was bad weather. It was raining off and on and the sun would come out. But, but that kind of stuff, I could see it was going to happen on, on the weather uh, because, you know, just predictions, um, just what the weather predictions were. So, but I caught some great light here. Um, I, didn't, I didn't even know it at the time, but Dave Allen, I don't know if you're familiar with Dave Allen, but uh, he's a phenomenal photographer and he was just sitting right beside me taking pictures and I, I guess I was just in my element and didn't talk very much to him because he was talking to somebody else but uh, he got almost this same image but it was just spectacular light um, but this was taken near sunset it wasn't right at sunset um, but um, 
before that, uh, around four o'clock, the light was good enough. I knew if I could find a waterfall that was down in the canyon, I could capture nice light. So I just, just happened to drive by and I pulled off on a, at a, at a pull off and uh, heard this waterfall. And so I went down and sure enough, there's this big waterfall down there. So I crawled down and went down in the ravine, landed like, like John does. And it was pretty treacherous, went down into the ravine and took a while to find my composition. And I found this fern uh, that was in the foreground here. It was a very you know, awkward position to be in to set it up. But, um, but this was a focus stacked image and I still got that nice light on top of the, on top of the falls because it was around four o'clock. So the light was still kind of, the sun was still kind of setting. And then I hurried back so that I could get the sunset. And so uh, this is some, and so as the storm clouds were going away, it opened up and it just, this amazing light just shone, it just shined through. I used my 80 to 400 millimeter lens on this to zoom up and capture the, this never ending pattern. That's why I like woolly backs so much because it just has this never, I mean, it just goes on and on and on forever. So I really like that overlook. So I just stayed there. And, uh, and this was, and so the clouds actually went away right at sunset. And then I've got a picture that I've been wanting for a long time to get the sun really big uh, behind the mountain range. And so I, this was shot at probably, I think around, uh, it was 400 millimeter and then I had my, uh, had it in DX mode, the 18, 810 and DX mode and, and shot the crop mode and shot this. So yeah, I guess it was probably around what, um, 500, 550 millimeter or so. But, uh, but I love that, I always wanted that image. But I got that all in one day, one evening, all those shots. So, and that's again, just judging weather. And I could have I lucked out. I mean, it could have been cloudy, but it, it turned out pretty well. Um, the next morning, I, there was gonna be good light again, but I really wanted a waterfall shot and I really wanted to get Mingo Falls. It's just like, I've been wanting to go to this waterfall forever. And so I, I just decided, even though it's gonna probably be pretty light at the top, at the, at the, up at the top of the mountains, I went to Mingo Falls instead, got there at dark, hiked in and, um, and just got this nice light. I don't know how many false shots that I've seen on Mingo Falls that has light over it like this. Um, not too many. And I just got lucky. I, I think this was shot at 12 millimeters. It was wide open so I could get all the sky as much as I could. And I believe, I think I, this may be a focus stacked image too. I did do a lot of focus stacking and I also uh, shot in aperture mode to uh, so I varied my shutter speed so that I could uh, paint the paint the nice texture in the in the water. Uh, so I do a little bit of uh, manipulation in that sense because um, I like it and I like the texture in the water, not too frothy. Um, so so that was one experience uh, about a uh, a year and a half ago. My family and I decided to go to uh, do a, a Southeast Coast trip. So we went to the number one spot I wanted to go to was Cumberland Island. I highly recommend Cumberland Island. It is just an incredible place. I mean, I love the live oaks. I wanted live oaks and I wanted Spanish moss and I wanted good light. And really the only way to experience it that way is to camp there. It's operated by the National Park Service. You have to take a ferry out to go to it and it, there's one that leaves at nine in the morning and then, there, and then it leaves to return home around four or five, I think. So you cannot capture sunrise, sunset on the island unless you camp there. So my, daughter, so my family and I went there all day long and then my daughter and I, my oldest daughter and I camped out and we camped out and I got some spectacular light just because I made sure, I mean, I just, you know, most people probably wouldn't like to tent, tent camp in a sandy area, but it was worth it to me because I got so many cool places. This is just an unreal place. This was just a service road that I caught. There's a, there's a road that goes all the way down the middle of the island. I think it's about seven miles long and there's live oaks all the way down it. It's just an amazing place. Wild horses on the island. But, uh, but this was just, you know, this wasn't even sunset. I just kind of shot bracketed images and then I kind of blended them using luminosity mask to get a natural looking image. Hey, hey Keith. Yes. Are we at a point where you could uh, pop those to full screen? 
Oh, yes. Thank you for reminding me. I told you I were a member. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, let's see. Okay. I'm just being greedy. I want to see it all. How about that? That looks That's good. Better? Yep. So I really like this image. It kind of looks like the trees were kind of grabbing the sun and, uh, and they're all pointing towards the sun, the, the palmettos here. And I just really like this image a lot. Um, I shot this with a 28 to 300 lens and, and focus stacked it. Um, this was not intentional. I didn't plan on this light here, but this was on the beach. My daughter and I, like I said, the last ferry leaves around five o'clock or four o'clock, I can't remember but we had this beach all to ourselves. I mean, for miles. And so we, we just sat out and, and we had a beautiful sun. I just happened to, by luck, have sunset, a beautiful sunset on this, on this particular evening. And so got good light there. That was a luck, that wasn't planned. All right, so another thing that I, I did, the next stop was Jekyll Island. And most of you are familiar with Jekyll Island and it is famous for its driftwood beach which happens to be on the north end of the island, the northeast end. Well, I did try shoot your driftwood beach with everybody else, but I, my goal was to shoot on Andrews Beach. And Andrews Beach is a driftwood beach on the southwest side, which not hardly many people visit. And so again, I used my methodology to predict, and you can see this image is, I love the trees. I just love the trees. And I'd already scouted this on Google Maps, on Google Earth, and I used that a whole lot too, and uh, saw that these trees look pretty good. And then I went there and used my middle of the day to scout it out with my family. We just kind of enjoyed being at the beach. And, um, and so, but the thing is, what's this image missing? It's missing good light, wrong time of the day, right? And it's also missing water. So I really wanted water. So another useful technique that I want to teach you is this. You can predict when certain tides are going to be there. And I'm missing, oh, here it is. Okay, this is what I actually got though. This is my, this is my actual image. Let me go back to this view. This is the image I got, the final image. So that's quite a difference, this versus this, but you can see it's the, almost the exact location, okay? So how I predicted this, I knew when sunset was gonna be from Photographer's Ephemeris. And you can, like I said, you can be very exact with photographer, Photographer's Ephemeris, here it is right here. You can see, and we'll zoom up on it. I mean, look at that. That's the exact spot where I was. And there it is. But then you can also predict the tide. So I wanted to know on which day, which day would I actually have water there? Because I'd hate to get there and shoot the sunset and there not be any water. So what I use is NOAA tides. And tides, you gotta be very careful. Some places have extremely dangerous tides. So you gotta be very careful. So it's really simple. All you have to do to predict tides. I know when my sunset time was on Photographer's Ephemeris, I think it was like uh, around, I'm not gonna go and look at it, but I think it was like 821. And so uh, what I did was, is I knew when we were gonna be going, cause we we're gonna go to Cumberland Island first and we'd be around Jekyll Island. So I knew approximately where we we're gonna be. So it was gonna be somewhere around here these days. And so I tried to find when high tide would be at sunset. So I put in the days here, my range, and then you go along and here, these would be high tide, this is low tide, high tide, low tide. And if we go along, we can see that high tide here is at 9, 19 p.m. So 7.31 would work, okay? That would work because high tide, no, I'm sorry, that would not, uh, that would, yes, that would work because water would be coming in. I at least want water coming in and not be low tide. So you could, but you can see at 731, it'd be eight feet high. So you certainly couldn't shoot it at that time. Okay. So that's probably, that's a little bit too, too, uh, not going to work. So I actually shot it on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the first because high tide was at 1012. So that gave me another that gave me another two hours before high tide. So within that four, four o'clock was low tide, ten o'clock high tide. So it was somewhere right in between here. So it was about four foot high, and it all it, it was making me uncomfortable. Actually, um, I was it was up to my my um, waist, and uh, and I was more worried about like sharks more than anything that bite me at that time, but. Um, but I did get out of there, but I at least got my shot that I wanted and got out of there before the time. I mean, it came up pretty fast too, uh, but that is a way to predict tides. You just gotta be careful about that because 
you know, some places, the further you go up north in the northern hemisphere, the greater the tidal change. So you got to be very careful about it. Does anybody have any questions about that? Because that is my last, um, that's my last little point. I'm a thing that I'll also use that I think hopefully y'all will find beneficial. Uh, there aren't any questions on the tide. I'm going to hold back two of the questions towards the end of your. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Moving on. Here's another picture that I took at high at the tide, same tidal time. I used a, a 10 stop neutral density filter on this one to blur the water. Whereas this, I don't didn't do it. I wish I could have, but my 12 to 24, I don't have a, I know I just don't want to invest, you know, hundreds of dollars on a filter system, to be honest with you. Um, I, sh I don't shoot with a polarizer at all on my 12 to 24. Uh, I, it was this day that I do wish I at least had a polarizer or a, or a neutral density filter to stretch out the water. It would have been a, even a much better image than that. But this one, you can see the effect of that. It just really makes it nice and surreal. All right, so my next stop was, um, was Savannah. We went to Savannah and one of the places I wanted to go was Wormslow. And again, we were having pretty stormy weather and I knew those greens would be so bright. And so we went to uh, Wormslow and I shot this in the rain. You can even see the rain puddles here. But I found that, and, and when I got there it was no closing and the cars were going up and down the road. It was just such a pain. I was trying to take time lapses so at least I could paint the cars out over time. But what I found, what, and what's interesting is they have, have put a sign right in the middle of the road. So it's just like right in your picture. Um, so, um, so I waited till after they closed and I stood outside the gate and I used my long lens and my crop fence fit factor on the DA-10. And that is one thing I love about uh, Nikon cameras is they, if you're using a full frame, you can go down to crop mode and extend your range. And so I did that. I had, I went, this time I was using a 28 to 300. And so that gave me about 450 millimeters. I was able to shoot past the sun and everybody was gone. So guess what came out? deer started coming out. And so this buck is actually a buck. You can see the antlers on the full print. And he just comes and sits right in the middle of the, right in the middle of the road. And I got the image. So I got that very lucky with that. Um, if you haven't visited the Angel Oak in uh, South, in, on John's Island, South Carolina, you need to go. It is absolutely amazing how big that tree is. And so I wanted a picture of the Angel Oak um, uh, Dave Allen has an awesome picture of this as well. Uh, I, I, excuse me. He has a picture of it, an awesome picture. I can't say this is necessarily an awesome picture, but I love it. It's a great picture to me and because I was happy with it. Uh, but the only problem with two problems with this place, well, three problems. Number one, you cannot use a tripod, which is just stupid, but you cannot use a tripod. They will not let you. Number two, there's people everywhere. So I had to hold my camera down. I shot this at uh, F8, I think ISO 1000. And I just sat there and, you know, just like I did in my kayak and tried to get a sharp picture because I bracketed exposures because the, the light was, you know, pretty bright up here. And, um, and then also I was doing that so that I could catch, you know, clone people out as they moved around. But the last major thing and the most irritating thing about this place is that they have put signs up and ropes all around the trunk. So I obviously did some creative photoshopping, cloning out around here, but you can't hardly tell it. And uh, that is, that's, an, but I'm telling you to see the Angel Oak, it is just worth it. It is just an amazing place. Uh, may, before it's gone, go see it. I mean, it's hundreds, I think around 500 years old or so. They think it may be older than that. So that was, uh, so that was, uh, just a, a little bit. And that's, that's my plan. I've given you my, my methodology. And um, so let's move on here. Um, so planning for great light, light in local places. Okay. Just like I was saying, I have, I have places all around where I live about 20 minutes to 30 minutes from where I live. If I see that it's going to be great light with my reading the weather and photographer's ephemeris, then I'm going to be at those places. So I'm just going to quickly go through these because I'm, I'm obviously I've been talking too long. I knew this was going to happen. So, um, so this is a place called Wheeler Wildlife Refuge. And I do a lot of shooting around here. And this beautiful goldenrod, what's blooming, you can see it from the interstate. It's just so bright. So I went there and shot that. And there's a local swamp near there. And I went to this swamp and uh, caught, and it was going to be foggy that morning. I predicted fog and it was foggy. And all it takes is just a little fog to get nice beams in this forest, in this, in this uh, um, 
Wheeler Wildlife Refuge area. Uh, it's called uh, we Beaver Dam Boardwalk. And like I'm standing on a boardwalk and, and this tree is no longer here anymore. So I've lost my main photographic element to no more, it's gone. But, um, but I caught some nice light there. Um, this is around the same area. Again, I mean, there's 20 minutes from my house, same area. Um, here I was shooting sunrise. I, I predicted that it was gonna be kind of foggy, but if you can get 60% sky cover and also fog all coming together at the same time, you can just get some spectacular light. And uh, here's an important rule for photographs. Always look behind you. So here I took this image. This is what it was like behind me. Always take a look behind you because most of the time you're gonna have some cool light behind you too when you've got a beautiful sunrise. So always look behind you. Um, around the same area, I've had these three silos. Um, I've always wanted to try to capture, I, it's one of those things in my mind, I'm like, if I could just capture that in great light. Well, I knew it was gonna be great light because it was really stormy, but the sun was gonna come out. It's good prediction that it might come out. So I was there and it was just perfect. I had a great sunrise and it just, this is one of my most popular photos. And, and like I said, I just, I, it, it took me about five years before I actually got the photo I wanted, but I waited and I just kind of have things in the back of my mind and I have places scouted and I'm just there when the light is good. And here's a little, a, a wide angle shot, 12 millimeter shot. Uh, uh, this is winter wheat uh, of the uh, same situation, same, just beautiful light that morning. And this is that swamp, but yet in the fall. Uh, again, I had foggy conditions with nice light and it just, just, and I, this is just a, just a beautiful place. I just love spending time at Beaver Dam Boardwalk. And uh, one of my favorite photographers is Lars Vandegore. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he does incredible forest photography. And I can't say that this is just an incredible photograph, but I say this is one of my photographs that reminds me of his, okay? His trumps mine by a long shot, but, but I really love this. He has just beautiful light in his photographs. Um, and again, just along the way, just beautiful light and foggy. I'm always, there's this road that runs through Mooresville right around in that area. And if you've got fog, if you've got fog predictions, so this, this was shot in the summer after a hard rain. And so there was going to be 10% chance of sky cover. So there was probably going to be fog. And so I just shot light beams all day long on this road. Um, another place is near my house, uh, Wheeler Wildlife Refuge again. Uh, this particular spot has these sunflowers. Uh, they're called tickweed, actually. And uh, they bloom in September. And this was, this was taken this past September. And this was the most intense bloom I've ever seen. This is taken with my 12 millimeter again. Uh, but I just love the sky. The sky was just uh, spectacular. Um, and this is a local place too, Vinemont, Alabama, just about 20 minutes south of me. And there's a stream there. And I've shot this stream multiple times. With And I, again, I'm just waiting for the right light. They have, it has good fall colors sometimes. So the water levels on this particular occasion were high and they had good fall colors. And it just, I got some cool images uh, I got, a sh we don't snow much in Alabama, but I did get a winter shot there. And what I like about it is that we have these beech trees in Alabama. Uh, Linda now knows about these, right? <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, and they keep their colors. They keep their leaves all, all winter long. So they, when it had, you have a hard rain, it makes the ground real dark and that beautiful orange color contrasts good with the ground. And it obviously contrasted well with the snow. And so it just kind of worked together. This is in a calendar in the Wild and Scenic Alabama calendar in the in Wal, um, Walmart and whatever this year in the uh, department stores. But, and this is another shot that I took at the fall. Um, and I shot this with a 28 to 300 and I focused at it to try to give it a, you know, a more realistic feel than, a, than a, like a wide angle. Um, another place is in Speak, Alabama, that sometimes you'll catch a canola field every now and then in Alabama. It just happened to be on one of my favorite roads. And uh, I like this one because it just kind of seems to go on forever. And, uh, and I had canola and just happened to get some good light on that particular evening. I think I was coming back from a workshop that day and I just happened to stop. This wasn't really planned, I have to confess. All right, so find good ways to find ways to get unique views. Um, 
that's another thing. Find good, find ways to get unique views. Well, my my way is kayaking. Um, like I said, I, 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 I was into photography before I was into kayaking, but eventually we got into kayaking, and I, I just love it. Uh, and my, like I said, my mentor, Charles Seafried used to shoot from his kayak all the time. And I just loved his kayaking shots. So you see his influence in me. And, um, this photo was actually won first place in the uh, outdoor Alabama contest this past year. But this, this particular sun, it was incredible. I predicted good light, but then the clouds just, and earlier on in the morning, afternoon, excuse me, they just kind of all went away. But then they came back at sunset and produced this amazing light. And when you're in the kayak, you just get this beautiful reflected light, not only in um, the water, but on the kayak itself. I splash up water on the kayak so you get the, you know, it gives the texture. Um, but, uh, and also was moving too. I'll, I'll paddle and then I'll, and then I'll put my paddle down real quick and then I'll snap images. So it keeps, makes it look like that I'm paddling in the water. And so I've done that. Um, uh, this, this is another one of my favorite kayaking shots. This place is actually about 10 minutes from my house. So if I see good light, if I see it's going to be really good and I'm not even studying weather, I just look up at the sky and go, oh man, it's going to be incredible. I'll go grab my kayak and I have a 15, this is a 15 and a half foot kayak, by the way, a sea kayak. And, uh, and I put in and I just got amazing photos this evening. And, and so this, like I said, this is about 10 minutes from my house, just a backwater area. Uh, and this is another shot that I took this past summer of the Saharan dust storms when they were coming across uh, the sky. We had such beautiful sunrises and sunsets. And again, I predicted the light and, uh, and it, did, um, you know, it did pan out. I had, man, that was an incredible sunrise. Um, I definitely wanted to get to this shot. Um, we have some amazing places in Alabama. We have amazing caves. And this is one of them, it's called Stevens Gap Cave. You have to have a permit to go there. But this is, hello, John Sharp right here that's with us tonight. And uh, he and another guy named Danny Head, we all went shooting that day. It's the first time I ever met uh, John as far as you know, face to face. And we had a great time. And, um, we just happened to, you know, we had pretty good light and we had a lot of rain recently. This, this cave uh, has two openings. One, one people rappel down into and the other one you walk down into. And uh, there's five waterfalls in this cave. You have one here, one here, one behind us over here, one here and one here. And so it's just so misty in there and it's pretty cold. Uh, but you get some, you can get amazing, during certain times of the year, you can get light beams that come down in this area. And there's a little platform that you can't see in the picture that people stand on and the light will come down and you can capture people that way. But I told John, I said, go over there. I said, go over there and stand. And he did. And this actually turned out to be a pretty cool image. I really like it. Um, I know I'm running out of time here. I don't want to. Do not worry about that, Keith. Okay. Not for one second. Just so. So anyway, I, just, I noticed a lot of videos go like an hour on this, but it's uh, like I said, I've got plenty of, of content here. Um, I love trees. I absolutely love shooting trees. And so I'm always interested in trying to find unique trees. I'm always looking around trying to find unique trees and trying to find isolated trees. And this is place, this is again, about 20 minutes from my house. And I was headed to go shoot somewhere else. Uh, but, uh, but it just so happened that the and it was predicted light, good light that morning, but it just so happened that we had a, some pretty nice atmosphere and I stopped at this tree and shot it that particular morning. It's a pretty pro popular image and um, I, I just love this tree. That's like I said, I just happened to be, you know, I knew where that tree was. I'm just waiting for the light and it was, that was the day. That was the day. Um, on that same day, uh, we had, I just had awesome light. I went, this was my first time at this particular canyon and it's called Hurricane Creek Canyon. And I just love, we have amazing beech trees in Alabama. Um, and I, they just have these buttressing roots. And this particular scene, you just, I had this amazing beech tree with this waterfall in it. It just kind of all went together. I mean, you wouldn't think this place would be Alabama, but it is. We have so many beautiful places in Alabama. This is in Bankhead National Forest in a really remote loca location. I mean, it's, it's not something where you just get out of your car and snap a picture. It's, you know, you got to do some pretty hard hiking to find these places, but they are, 
it's just so fun just to get out and explore. I'm an explorer. I just go out and explore. I'm a good, I can read maps real easy, topographic maps real easy. So I kind of can gauge where waterfalls are. And so I can, I just like to hunt for them. And so I, I found quite a few. This place I found, these I found recently. These are beech trees. And again, this is kind of a, a Lars Van de Gore reminds me of his images. I had a foggy day that day. I knew it was going to be foggy. And so I'd found these trees before, this other tree, I'll show it to you. But uh, this just, these trees just happened to stand out on how this one was curved. And again, they got the pretty orange color. They don't lose their leaves. And so I just snapped it and it just, I just love this image. Um, but uh, I rarely take portrait shots, but I did with this one. Um, this is a tree, I, I found this tree, I found it, and like I said, it's about 10 minutes from my house. Um, I was just scouting, looking around, just wandering through the forest and came across it. And then I, uh, I had my camera gear, but at the time when I was there, it was still really green and it just really wasn't great. So I waited till fall and I came back to it and caught it. And I kind of muted the colors a little bit because I wanted it to be about the tree. And, uh, and with the 12 to 24, it just stretched it out and it just gave a, such a cool, uh, cool look to it. And this is also a beech tree that's on, on the same creek. This is off shot on Flint Creek near my house. And I've kayaked past this tree many times and I've often wondered how good it would look in a photograph. And uh, so I, one day I just got out and, and scouted it. I was like, yep. And so at that time it was green, real green. And it just wasn't as appealing. I thought, well, I'm just going to wait till fall when those pretty yellow leaves come out because the beech trees are actually yellow and then they turn orange. And, um, and so I did. And I, I caught this nice sunset or the sun coming through. Even though this was a very uh, bright day, I still caught the sun and I just kind of muted, I added some glow to take off the edge of the white. And, uh, but anyway, so beech trees, I love them. Shoot in bad weather. Um, this is a place that probably a lot of you are not familiar with. I don't know, maybe that could be wrong. But, you know, Alabama has the deepest canyon on the, the east side of the Mississippi. And it's about 400 foot deep. It's called Little River Canyon. And uh, it is known, and Little River Canyon is known for two things. I even want to show this because I tell people. I got this book at home. It's called The Ten Best of Everything National Parks. And this is a look, this is a national preserve. And uh, in this book, Little River Canyon is known for number one, fall colors. It's the top 10 for fall colors in the United States. And it is, you can see why. And number two, it's known for the big waterfalls. It has a 300 foot at the beginning of the canyon, it has a 300 foot wide, 60 foot tall waterfall called Little River Falls. And I'll show you a picture of it. But this is a picture that I waited on for like five years. I found this tree on this overlook called Wolf, Wolf Creek Overlook, and I just I was like, man, if I just had the right light, this tree would be perfect. I shot this with a 12 to 24 lens, and this tree is probably no more than three foot tall, and I just waited. The night before, it just stormed. I even camped out at a campground in a tent, and it stormed on me all night long, but I was like, yes, because I knew that in Little River Canyon, when it storms, you just get amazing fog. And, and it did. That morning, it, it was, it was kind of like those conditions I was talking about with, up in uh, North Carolina, where it was kind of be sunny and cloudy off and on all day long. And so that's the way it was. And I got so many amazing images this particular day. But it was because of the conditions. So this is Little River Falls um, that I was talking about. And uh, this is a unique position. Most people just shoot it from the top because uh, there is a, a platform where you can shoot it. But uh, if you're brave, you can go down in the canyon, which it is a very hard hike. But you can go down the canyon. I found a real easy way down, but you got to hike up boulders all the way to the falls. But I was right underneath the falls and uh, just gave this beautiful perspective. Um, just really makes you feel like you're there. Um, here is the really the signature shot of Little River Canyon. This is around the deepest point in the canyon. You can see how high it is, but the fall colors that morning were just absolutely stunning. Um, it's probably one of the prettiest falls that I've seen there. Uh, but this is from an unknown, an unnamed overlook that's not really not even in the park. Um, it's outside the park, but I know where it is and, and some, several other people do too. 
Um, here's another place. Uh, this is in Bankhead National Forest. Again, very foggy morning. It was super stormy that day and lightning everywhere, but I still went out in bad weather and I shot. Um, this was really what I was wanting to capture. This is called Natural Bridge Recreation Area. And this is, it's hard to tell, but this is actually a natural bridge. If I backed up, it could show you. Uh, but uh, I was really wanting to capture this beautiful, this cool tree with this open light. And uh, so that, again, it's called Natural Bridge uh, Recreation Area in Bankhead National Forest. Uh, this is, this was in Backpacker Magazine this past fall. Um, this is called Parker Falls in Bankhead. And this is actually in the Sipsi Wilderness area. And uh, Bankhead is called the land of a thousand waterfalls. And that is no joke. On a good rainy day after it's really stormed, there is waterfalls, there are waterfalls everywhere. And uh, this is one that flows all year, fortunately, uh, just a trickle in the summertime. But on this particular day, it was taken in the summer, but it had stormed the night before. And I knew I was watching the water levels on that Alabama whitewater and I was there. Uh, it was humid. The sun was popping in and out. I just got incredible light all day long. And so this was, you can see where the light was over here that was just getting close to sunset and uh, just beautiful. I knew I had a, I knew I had a calendar shot whenever I took this image. It was just an amazing scene. This was down the canyon a little bit, another waterfall. I think it's called uh, Parker Cascades or something, but uh, just down the, I just love exploring canyons. I just love it. So anyways, I, I'm about, I, I don't want to talk too much longer. You just tell me when to stop. Like I said, if you want me to continue, then I'll continue. If not, then I'll take questions. Okay. So how about, let me throw out two questions. I'll let you come back and maybe wrap up for us and okay. then uh, we'll close out. Okay. So there was a question that asked, do you, do you, use focus stacking through Photoshop? Well, I mean, I use, <laughs> I, I focus stack in camera, you know, just turning the lens. But mm -hmm. then, yes, I use blending, the blend function in Photoshop to okay. focus stack my images, yes. Okay, I think that I was- I don't use, I don't do the hand blend anymore. That's too hard, man. It's just focus stacking on Photoshop, just, I mean, it's perfect. Okay, mm -hmm. and then there was a question early on. It was, um, I think it was when you were showing, uh, I, okay, so what program do you use to scope out the view in the mountains? And I think it was Google, Google Maps. Google Maps, okay, okay. There's Google Maps has a little orange dude that okay. you just yeah. drag down and it gives you the street view. And then you can kind of like wherever you're going, you can see what it's like before you get there. So you can go, oh, well, is that a good place to go? No, nah, it didn't look like you got this. All this is in the way, you know? Okay. Okay. Well, those are the two questions that were still left in the chat. Um, let's see here. All right. So do you want to kind of, can you kind of tie, us, tie, it, tie it up, uh, summarize for us or some last sure. thoughts that you want to share? Well, I just, like I said, just, uh, just like I said, just study the weather, study the weather. Again, remember, 40 to 60 percent chance of sky cover is a good way to predict. If you know, don't don't go out and shoot when it's 10 percent chance of sky sky cover. You just go unless you just really just itching to go shoot because you're not going to get a good sunset. But between 40 to 60 percent, 70 percent, you're really up your chances of getting getting good light. Um, like I said, and also the don't forget the uh, the temperature and the dew point in agreement with about 100, you know, 95 to 100% humidity and 10% sky cover, you're gonna get those beautiful light beams in the forest. Um, so like I said, just plan. Think about your thing, but before you go, look at all those things, like uh, go ahead and set your plan, your directions of the light, when the sunrise is gonna be, when the sunset's gonna be, and then have several places set up and then like, here's another thing I, I forgot to say, like, if I am planning to go shoot, like, um, Foothills Parkway in the Great Smoky Mountains Park, I want to shoot the mountain ranges, and it's going to be 10% sky cover, and there's probably not going to be much fog, then I'm going to, instead, there, I'm going to be down, I'm going to be probably down in the valley shooting waterfalls, okay? So you can find, find something else so that you up your possibilities of getting good photographs, OK? 
Okay. You can shoot and can't, you know, as long as I, like when I go shoot canyons, I, most of the time I'll go at before dark, before daylight and I'll go in and hike in and then I'll have at least three hours of good light before the light hits the canyon. And so I can capture, it'd be like being on a cloudy day. So that's, and so that's what I do with my workshops. We start early. Uh, because I want to make sure my clients get great images. And I'm going to put you on the spot for half a second because somebody sent me a message and said, I just checked his website and I don't see any workshops. So what's the deal with that, Keith? Well, be honest with you, COVID <laughs> really shut me down last year, just yeah. like everybody else. Everybody else. Yeah. And I'm having a hard time. Because it, even now, I like to, when I do my workshops, I like to do a morning workshop. And then I like to have a Photoshop Lightroom class, a processing class, and I like to do an afternoon class uh, where we go out and shoot again. And I cannot reserve rooms. The places where I go, I cannot reserve rooms. So because of that, you know, I can't do that part, which I think is a fundamental thing about my workshops that I really like. So you're left, you know, you can go around and find pictures in poor light, but it's hard to, you know. Sure. Uh, so, um, so it, it's kind of held me back. I am having one February the 20th, but I sold it out. I mean, it sold out pretty quick. And I, mm -hmm. I am planning, I will say this, I, I just am really busy right now. And sure. that's another thing. I try to work workshops in when I'm in my schedule, my teaching schedule, and sometimes it gets just too busy and I can't do it. Sure. So I try to offer about three workshops per year, three to four workshops per year. And uh, so I, de I will probably have a workshop, just be looking for it on my website. I'll probably have one lined up. Um, probably around the first week in April, because we have wildflowers here in Alabama, just like in the Smokies and Bankhead. It's like Bankhead is like Smokies, but Smokies is Bankhead on steroids. So. Okay. Wow, those are those are strong words. Those yeah. are real strong words. That's what I mean. I mean, it's like, it's a little picture of the Smokies. You know? yeah. uh, sure. It really is. All right, um, guys. Uh, well, first of all, Keith, thank you for, for doing this for our group. Um, this was for me educational because that's one of the things that I struggle with is understanding weather. And uh, there's just a lot of, lot of I'm going to rewatch this a couple of times and probably just keep rewinding until I can follow you on your, on your, how you applied, you know, weather to good light. And so I was, I was really excited to hear you cover that. So well, hopefully I didn't go too fast. Uh, I know I talk fast sometimes. So well, well that's that's the beauty of, of rewind. And I I think I have your yeah, I, I'll I'll DM you. Uh, I yeah, I'm not afraid well, to do that. To, anybody feel free to email me if, if you have a question. I don't mind. Okay. Don't mind Great. All right, guys. Uh you guys can find Keith at Keith Bozeman Photography. Dot com. And if you're on Instagram, you can find him at K Bozeman Photos. So next week, my guest is Kelly Ishmael, who will be here to present Everyday Magic. So until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope to see you again soon. <laughs>